Alrighty, okay. Hello all. My name is Rajesh and um, I'm the organizer of this meetup. Fantastic meetup, delivery leadership. We have um, often every every month I organize something. I try to organize something and um, mostly the topics are around agile or um, delivery or leadership or uh, anything digital innovation. So anyone who is interested in speaking, let me know. As a day job, I work for Microsoft as principal project manager and uh, do some project management mostly focuses on um, uh, experimentation and um, the product management. So this meetup is specifically when I uh, on another channel I asked, so we do have a Slack channel. I, I asked uh, if anyone is, anyone is interested in talking because I was looking for people. Any raised her hand up and she said, I have something to share. And she said, this is the topic. And I immediately said, that's a fantastic topic because there are so many people who uh, do not know how to deliver unexpected things. Communication is a challenging thing for a lot of people, and it, specifically when it comes to um, talking to the managers and giving them something, uh, some some sort of a news which is not favorable to them, then that becomes really, really difficult for a lot of people. So specifically for us, um, the delivery people mainly, yeah? So we scheduled this, and um, the reason we are recording this is uh, there were some requests from other people who can't join, but looking at, Nearly 150 people have joined this um, or registered for this meetup. I can see how important the topic is. Talking about any and thanks any for uh, accepting my request and uh, preparing this presentation. So talking of any, she works for uh, Merkel Group, also known as Isobar previously, so digital and she looks after she's the uh, delivery director there and um, uh, she she looks after many digital projects and I know her from the, some of the other Agile Slack channels. She's very active there. So, and whenever you see someone put in a smart comment, arguing, uh, putting some good arguments, they're intelligent people. So of course, yeah, that's any. Handing over to you and let's start there. Thank you. Thanks so much for the intro. Um, before um, I get started, uh, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodians of the lands on which we work and where we are today and pay our respects to Indigenous elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty has never been ceded and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So um, for this meeting, I actually can't see any of your faces, so um, you don't have to turn your camera on, I can't see you, but it might be nice for other people to see you. Um, but definitely when we get to the Q&A, if you can turn your camera on, that would be awesome. If you don't want to, that is also totally OK. Um, please meet yourself. The reason is because I will get distracted. I will lose my train of thought. Um, during Q&A, if you can try and figure out where to use the hand emoji, it's in the top, the top navigation near the three dots, sort of. That's a terrible description. Um, and also, this um, session is being recorded because a lot of people have asked if um, it could be. Um, so just bear in mind with what you share in the chat when we go through that. Um, so yes, just letting you know in advance. So a little bit about who I am. Um, I'm Annie Moller. Uh, I'm from New Zealand. This is a photo uh, of me in front of my actual house in New Zealand. Um, and I have a cat called Walter, and I love him uh, more than he loves me, but he tolerates my love and affection. Uh, and I'm also a project manager by trade. I've been delivering agile web and app projects for a long time, probably a little bit longer than what I would like to share. Um, and I've had some pretty tricky situations that I've had to deal with over the years. Uh, I now work at a company called Merkel, where I've been for almost eight years a very long time, uh, delivering design and technology projects and developing agile and ways of working training programs. Uh, and when I looked for a photo of me at work, all I found were a thousand photos of post-it notes from workshops uh, over the years and a single photo of me looking really pissed off. I assume that is, uh, sorry, I let you know that that is not a true uh, interpretation of me at work. I'm a little bit nicer than that. Um, today, I'm the executive directory of delivery, which means ultimately um, that I'm responsible for the success for, successful delivery of all of our projects. 
Uh, and thankfully to do that, I have a team of incredible project managers uh, and business analysts led by three super, super smart heads off. These days on the executive leadership team though, I spend most of my time solving business problems, thinking about our ways of working, our culture and helping people. So the problem with communication. Now, I know that there are probably quite a few people from the Agile community who are here today. Um, so what would this presentation be without uh, a Dilbert comic strip? Um, but it's true. So many people are not very good at communicating and communicating is quite hard. Um, I also recently found out that I'm autistic, which really sheds a lot of light on why I've always found communicating uh, so hard and also um, such a special interest and quite fascinating and vice versa when people communicate with me. A little bit of a mystery at times. While that is a topic for a whole other meetup, um, what it has led me to do is to be able to analyse my conversations and situations for patterns, uh, because that's what autistic brains are really good at, um, and human interactions and social psychology are one of my special interests. Okay, so before we get started, I would like you to think of a time that you had a bad communication breakdown. It could be at work, uh, could be in your personal life. What happened and why? Uh, if you're comfortable sharing in the chat, um, also remembering that it is being recorded, um, I'd love to have a look. What, what was that? Okay, being overwhelmed and busy and being a grump as a result, I feel you. Cultural differences, working in the US Midwest, yep, I used to live in Texas, so I can 100% relate to that. Different communication styles, when a colleague asked for guidance and this was ignored and a project was delayed as a result and having to rescue it, if it's emotionally driven, Different expectations of the same requirements. Yep, definitely. Being stretched across multiple projects and spreading yourself thin. Ooh, being a bystander for different personality types. Assumptions, assumed knowledge, different communication styles again. Reacting, not responding. Definitely ignoring diverse ideas. There are so many reasons <clears throat> why a communication breakdown can happen. Um, and when I was preparing for this presentation, I was looking for communication frameworks to just double check, had I come up with something that was already out on the internet? Um, and I came across this, and obviously this has nothing to do with what I'm talking about today, because it's clearly about some technology and computers <clears throat> and the internet. Um, but it's actually a perfect example of why communication is so hard. When you communicate to another person, you want that message to go straight from the source to the destination. But it has to go through this process of being transmitted and then converted and then received before it goes into the destination. And because we all have so many communication styles and preferences like people have mentioned in the chat, it makes it incredibly hard to cater for everyone's needs perfectly. And, you know, add in the fact that there's a lot of neurotypical people who don't understand neurodivergent communication. And to be honest, probably a lot of us neurodivergent people don't understand it either. It's, it just adds to the difficulty. And it's really, really easy for communications to go wrong. One thing I've noticed is that there tends to be two types of people. Those who think they're great at communicating, but are actually kind of bad and those who are bad, but are aware that they're bad. That is the Dunning-Kruger effect in true effect. Just think back to the last time you had a communication breakdown with someone, a family member, a partner, a friend, a workmate, a client. It happens all the time. And the impact of that is massive. Um, there's obviously a lot of reasons why we should communicate better at work, you know, with our peers, our stakeholders, our managers and our clients, uh, because when we don't do it well, 
it impacts people's mental health. That's really, we fuck up projects badly and we create environments that people don't enjoy working in. And those things are really, really bad. And they can, uh, you know, end up with, you know, some pretty significant um, cost impacts to businesses. Um, in 2011, the Standish Group put out the Chaos Manifesto 2011, which is a huge report with detailed analyses of what makes projects succeed and fail. If you haven't seen their chaos reports, they come out every few years. They're pretty great, especially if you love project stuff. I don't know about you. Um, I also don't know how old some of you are in the in the chat here. Um, but for those who have been around a little bit of a, a wee while, I'm not sure that a huge amount has changed in the world of project delivery about how we communicate between people. Yep, of course, Scrum is definitely way more of a thing now than it ever used to be. Um, and one of the principles is all about transparency. Um, but nothing in the Scrum or Agile, you know, none of it really specifically teaches people how, uh, or te te teaches people or teams how to communicate effectively. So not necessarily in uh, with each other or in that group. Yes, you've got things like stand-ups, retros, um, sprint reviews, um, but those are, you know, they're uh, events. They're not kind of, they're not tools that teach you how to do that. It's up to the individual scrum master or the agile coach or the company's HR team to train that team on how to communicate. But generally speaking, I mean, I'm not seeing a lot of companies invest a lot of time in improving how we communicate with each other. So I feel like while we've got some really great agile processes in place to encourage communication, we're not really doing it significantly better than what we were um, 10 years ago. Uh, and as you see, there are aspects of project communication such as you know, gaining trust to deliver bad news and delivering bad news quickly that are considered highly important. So you can see that in the top, um, in the top graph there, table there. Um, so they're considered highly important for project success, but they're also things that project managers and kind of generally people don't tend to be very skilled at. And this is because it's really hard. So, you know, if something happens on your project, something bad happens, what do you say? When do you say it? Um, how do you say it? Do you rip the Band-Aid off? Do you soften the blow? When's the right time to tell people? Do you tell them now? Do you tell them later? Like, there's so many things you have to think about. Um, there is one person that is not on mute. It would be amazing if you could mute yourself because I am getting di distracted. Thank you so much. Um, and because it's so hard, Delivering bad news can often feel like this. You know, um, I know there is a lot of people that are scared of dogs, probably because you've had a bad experience with dogs in the past and maybe you've been bitten. Um, but it's kind of the same sort of situation. You've probably been snapped at in the past uh, or you've had a bad reaction from someone. Oh shit, you may have even actually been fired for delivering bad news. And when it's gone badly before, you've been, you can become really scared of having to do it. You don't want to upset someone. You don't want to be snapped at. You don't want to be bitten by a dog. And so you feel fear. So the reason why people might snap or have a bad reaction is not necessarily because of the facts that you are delivering or that they're hearing, but for what that means for them personally. A lot of project sponsors or stakeholders may have personally advocated for that for years <laughs> to get their project off the ground. Um, and they often have a, like a lot of skin in the game for that to be successful. They might be thinking, oh my God, I am going to look so stupid in front of my peers. Oh my God, I, people are going to think that I have made the wrong decision and that I have failed and I might lose my job. So while before you delivered that news, you were scared of delivering the news, now they are scared of delivering the news to their superiors. And this fear stops you from communicating because you've experienced a negative fear from the response, which means that you're less likely to communicate that bad news early next time. So next time you encounter a project issue for that, you get that same fear response and negative feeling and you avoid it and the cycle continues and it is a vicious cycle. And all of this goes against the transparency principle of Scrum. 
So this kind of makes it really hard to implement agile ways of working well when people are scared to fail um, and they feel fear about communicating the facts. And if we go back to the 2011 Chaos Manifesto, executives also say that it's really hard to obtain and communicate the facts. Okay, <laughs> that's a chicken and egg situation. Okay, so a while ago, I was working with uh, someone who was really struggling to um, communicate you know, what was happening on that project to their project stakeholders about kind of like the truth about what was actually going on. And I was confused why that was. I would see emails, they were super vague, um, and they could be interpreted in many ways. And sometimes what I was reading or hearing in steering committee meetings or in the reports would actually make me wince and feel ugh, just like that ick feeling when you see something you're like, oh, I can't believe you said it like that. I don't think this is gonna be a good thing that's gonna happen after that. But they were doing their best because that is all anyone does in life and work. Um, but what I did notice is that um, in reflecting on this and what I needed to do and how I needed to help this person is that I have sub had subconsciously developed a method of communicating bad news and project issues that would minimise bad reactions from stakeholders um, that would um, kind of minimise that fear response. Clearly, there's some autistic pattern recognition going on here. Um, analyzing 15 years of delivering a variety of bad news to IT stakeholders and <clears throat> product owners and clients and, and finding an approach that seemed to work for me. <coughs> so <clears throat> if you've read Kim Scott's Radical Candor, uh, which by the way, if you haven't, you absolutely should. It's one of the best books that I've ever read. It is about... Um, how you manage people um, from like a kind of management perspective, but I honestly think it applies to everything, especially projects where you have to kind of talk to people. Um, but you'll know that building personal relationships mm -hmm. with a staff member is key to being able to challenge that person to work with them to get the best out of them. And that kind of applies for everything we do in business. We're built on human connection. So if you see your project sponsor once a month at steering committee and that is it, it's going to be really hard to deliver that bad news because you don't have a personal connection with them. So if you've got a new project, I definitely recommend setting up a one-on-one -on -one to get to know your project sponsor. You can just ask them anything. Learn, like, what do they do in their personal life? What are their kids' names? What do they like to do for fun? Like, it's that kind of personal stuff that really matters. You can also use this first one-on-one -on -one to start to talk about communication styles and preferences and start to ex set expectations about how you're going to work with them because you want to be transparent and you want to set that. There are some great ways to understand their communication style. Firstly, you can just ask them what is their communication style or their preferences. Um, but I do warn you that they may not be able to articulate this to you very well. To be honest, many people don't spend a lot of time analysing their communication styles, potentially unless they're neurodivergent, um, and a lot of people aren't actually able to clearly tell you what they want or need. If this is the case, you can use an online tool like uh, Crystal Nose, uh, which is kind of a little bit of a you know personality survey kind of business horoscopes. Um, but they can fill out a short survey and it's going to give you some ideas about how to communicate with them. If they don't want to do that, because I know a lot of executives are very busy and the thought of spending 15 minutes filling out a survey that they don't really want to do is probably not that fun. Um, it also has a little bit of a plug-in for your email and it will analyse their email and it will give you a guess on their communication style. And it's usually pretty bang on. So for me personally, I like to be communicated very directly and very clearly because that's also how I communicate. No innuendo, no assumption, and ideally with a short bulleted list. I personally don't mind if someone tells me that there is a, a problem on a project um, or if they tell me a problem without, with or without a solution, as long as they tell me that they have it in hand or they explicitly tell me that they want me to help them. Sometimes some of my team members like to have a bit of a rant about something, and that's fine. Um, and sometimes they just want me to listen. And sometimes they want me to um, bounce ideas off 
off, off each other so we can figure out what we need to do and do a bit of problem solving. And sometimes they just want to go away and solve a problem by themselves and feel like they have succeeded um, by solving that problem by themselves. I'm kind of fine with all of those things. Um, most of the time, though, I hate it when someone sends me an email that has a thousand words full of lots of paragraphs. Um, but unless someone says to me specifically, Annie, I need you to help me solve this problem, I'm going to assume that they've got it in hand. So get to know how your sponsor wants to work with you or your stakeholder. At Merkel, one of our company values is no bullshit. We tell our clients when we engage with them at the start of any relationship that we're going to tell them how it is. Uh, because many partners and vendors don't do that, sometimes it's a little bit unexpected. Um, so it's kind of good to give them a little bit of forewarning for that. Your project sponsor or your stakeholder might be not used to that. Um, but I guarantee they'll appreciate it. So I came up with this framework that I had accidentally come up with over the years that I had been using and hadn't even noticed. PayPal had to come up with a pithy little statement that you could somehow maybe try and remember. Problem, impact, plan, owner, and when. So problem, you're going to articulate what is the issue and you're gonna give them all the information that they need about what that issue is. Impact, you're going to explain how the problem is affecting the project either what is happening right now or what is probably going to happen. So either an issue or a risk. Plan, you are going to list out all the steps that needs to be done to resolve that problem. And the plan could be the steps to solve the problem, or it could be that you are going to put a plan together. Um, or it could be that you just actually just need their help to figure out what to do next. It kind of doesn't matter if it's the answer or not, it just needs to articulate what the next steps are and what that plan is. So owner, you're going to talk about who needs to be involved um, and what you've discussed specifically relating to that plan and who's going to do what. So a little bit of roles and responsibilities in there. And when, obviously, a next step date. So it could be the date that the problem's going to be solved or it could be the steps um, that are required to put together the plan for so when that's going to happen. Again, it kind of almost doesn't matter which one it is. You, it's all just about setting expectations about what's going to happen next. So let's use this very fun scenario, <coughs> one that I've definitely never seen on any project ever. It happens all the time. Excuse me, I'm just going to drink. So <clears throat> imagine you've got this problem, the API, is not returning correct data, the UI is just not working. Imagine if you went to your stakeholder and you told them that. What do you think is going to happen if you wrote this in an email or if you wrote it in a status report or you put it in your steering committee report? Well, I imagine this is going to happen. <laughs> this is probably what that person is going to be thinking. They are going to be thinking, what the fuck? They might also be angry. Um, they might be thinking, what do you mean it's not working? Who am I going to blame? Who am I pointing fingers at? Oh my God, this is going to fuck me up. I might lose my job. I mean, hashtag not all project sponsors are going to think like this, but a lot of people are because without giving them all of the kind of steps around PayPal, they don't know what the context is. They don't know what needs to happen. They don't know what they need to do. They don't know how you're expecting them to kind of act or respond. And you're not really giving them enough information. So I know this Photoshop is weird and funny, um, and I am in no way inferring that project stakeholders or people who get upset with news are babies. Um, but I think it's very, very easy to forget that each, each and every person has an inner child that can come out especially when they're reacting to like bad news or they're going into fight, fight or flight. These feelings are like they're hidden on the inside. Um, but, you know, I'm sure if you think, you know, what, what did I feel when I was six years old? It's kind of the same. You're kind of the same person, but everything else is a little bit different and older and weird. 
There is a really awesome video on YouTube by the School of Life. Another thing I definitely recommend, they've got amazing videos on their YouTube channel, which is called Why We Should Treat Partners Like Children. It talks about acknowledging people's inner child and treating it with benevolence. When a child gets upset and they have a tantrum or they cry, your first thought is, okay, they must be tired, they're cold, they're sick, their nappy's wet. You don't necessarily put a negative reaction on top of the tantrum. You accept it for what it is. It's an emotional outburst. There's an inner feeling that isn't being clearly communicated. This is why I talk about the motivations for understanding the negative reaction, because it's almost always not what you specifically have done, that you have specifically done something wrong. It's about them working through a thought process of what that news means. I was once told that project managers are like news reporters. The, your job is to deliver the facts. I love that saying. So remind this, <laughs> remind yourself of this when you do your job, um, because reactions to facts are not a reflection on you personally. I know it's very easy to say and it's very hard to do, but the more you tell yourself this, the easier it is to believe that it's true. Okay, so you've got this problem. The API is not delivering the data that's required for that UI. So before you figure out what you need to do to communicate the facts to your stakeholder, as a project manager, you need to kind of understand the data. And I know that, you know, there's a lot of project managers, especially ones who are kind of starting out in their career. So you've got a problem, what do you do next? So before you start to communicate this, you can use PayPal to brainstorm with your team about what is all the information that you need to go and figure out or learn or what do you need to do. Um, you can run an issue resolution workshop or a bit of a risk workshop and you can get everyone on board on how to solve that problem. Okay, so now we're definitely going a little bit beyond PayPal. Well, we're going to talk about uh, something that I have spent a lot of time thinking about, especially as a very, very direct person, about how to soften your language. Um, so assuming that you've got all the information that you need around how to communicate this issue to stakeholders, we kind of need to talk about language and how that impacts what you communicate and how it's received. And I don't know about you, but I definitely wasn't taught this stuff in school. I was taught this stuff by fucking it up and then being told that I should have done something different. Um, maybe if uh, you have English as a second language, maybe you were taught about these things, um, but I wasn't. So let's talk about that. So modal verbs. Modal verbs are verbs like could, would, may, uh, instead of using things like can. So the word like can you, can you please get this report ready by Monday is quite like hard and directive. And to be honest, I actually don't really understand why, why, why does that feel hard? Can you deliver this? Like it's quite pointy, but could you please get this report ready by Monday? That is a whole different scenario, and you've pretty much just changed one word. Do you want to be on our team? Pointy, directive, but would you like to be on our team? It's much more questioning and soft. So modal, word, uh, modal verbs are very, very helpful. Passive voice, very important. <clears throat> So when you give, when you use active voice, you're basically pointing the fingers at, some, at someone, someone, something, you're being very, very direct. So an active voice here, you've got the example, the project manager signed off those reports yesterday. The project manager, they did that. You're putting that at the front of the sentence. But in passive voice, the reports were signed off yesterday by the project manager, or even more simply, the reports were signed off yesterday. Like you don't have to assign blame to your words. And I know sometimes, and like this is something that I know that I am, um, that I would definitely do, is I'm very direct. So I'll give all of the facts and I'll just say, I'll just lay it all out. <clears throat> but the way that you structure these sentences and what you use is, is very important for how that is taken. So next one is choice of words. Um, and I think also this kind of depends on like your vocabulary. Um, now, again, this is probably a very revealing statement, but um, as an autistic child in the 80s, <laughs> where there was no internet, 
Um, I used to read the dictionary for fun. <laughs> so I have a pretty large vocabulary. So I will use lots of words because I enjoy words. Um, but sometimes you need to like change those words because it has a different meaning. So last year's project was a failure, like that pointy, like you, you, you can feel it when you say it, like it has this kind of like, from my perspective, it has like a really angular direction. Whereas if you say last year's project was not a success, like it just feels softer when you say it. Um, the software is useless. So like useless, that's a really like, that's a sharp word. But I want it to be, again, it's a sharp word. But if you say the software is not working properly, like you've kind of, you've added some extra words in there. And when you use something like, I hope, like it's quite positive. So you need to kind of add some positivity into, into these um, sentences. Rephrasing, another good one. So this is where you want to try and just change your words up um, and just like rephrase it so it's a little bit diplomatic. Um, another good um, tip that I was once told, um, which is once you write something, go back and read it, cut out half of the words, and then go back and cut out another half of the words. Um, that probably doesn't apply if you don't use very many words to start off with. Um, but that kind of process of doing that will give you the chance to go back and reword your um, what you're saying. This is obviously specifically if you're talking about, you know, writing it down. Also, never write something if you're angry, ever, because you will say something that is a little bit sharp. Um, so if you have here, you, if you look at the example here, our computer system is down. We're not sure how long it's going to take to fix. OK, it's a little bit. What, what do you do with that information? Next one, our computer system is down. We're now working on a fix and hope to have it up as soon as possible. Thanks for your patience. You haven't actually told them that you're doing anything differently. You've just said it in a different way that sounds much more positive. And the last one is minimizers. So this is where you use like small words, like to make it a little bit smaller. Now, this kind of feels a little bit like lying sometimes, um, but it's not. You're just using a word to make your message come across more clear and less abrupt. So instead of saying, there has been a delay in our shipment, it may take weeks to arrive. But if I got that, if I got that from Mecca, I'd be pissed off. But if they said, there has been a slight delay in our shipment, it may take a bit longer to arrive. I'd be like, okay, cool, understand. So those kind of minimizers are really, really helpful. Okay, so we're gonna go back to this fun scenario. We're gonna use some soft language and we're gonna use the PayPal framework. Uh, and we're going to use it in a way that is going to help your stakeholders to effectively obtain the facts, which we know is very important from that chaos manifesto. Okay, so we have discovered that the API delivered by the vendor doesn't match the API contracts that were agreed to at the start of the project. The API isn't returning data in the way that we had planned for and not all customer data is showing in the forms. Okay, so in this example, you've clearly explained what the project is, uh, what the problem is, um, and you've kind of given them, you know, a reasonable amount of information. Impact. We're going to need additional sprints to rework what was built, which is going to delay go live. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to identify an alternative option to go live with MVP without degrading the experience to users. So you've clearly related the impact of the project back to the problem that you've articulated. The team have already broken down the additional tasks and have estimated the work. If we go ahead with this option, we will need to communicate this to the steering committee and get sign off of additional budget. We also have the opportunity, opportunity to explore other MVP options with you to see if we can still meet the desired go live date. Okay, so, so far this still sounds like this is, it's not great. This is not a good scenario, but this is also the facts. These are the realities of the project and you are the news reporter. So you've told them what has happened, you've told them what needs to be done, and you've told them what needs to happen next. I believe the decision of whether to do the rework and to get agreement of the new go life date is with you, as with identifying alternative MVP options. Please let me know if that's correct. So clearly they know that this is something that they are now gonna have to take ownership of. When 
To keep momentum on the project towards go live, ideally we would have a decision by tomorrow. Let me know if this will be possible and if you need anything else to help you make your decision. If you want to proceed with the rework, I'll keep you regularly updated on prog progress of the rework. So here you're telling them like what needs to happen next in which order and also when it's going to happen. So you kind of laid out pretty much all of the facts here. If you compare that to <clears throat> the API delivered does not have all the customer data and the UI is not working, there's it's a whole it's like night and day in terms of the um, the reaction that you're going to get from that stakeholder because they're not just going to be like, well, what's why what's going on because you've already given that given them that information. So in terms of talking about um, going back to that soft language, let's have a look at some of the language that has been softened in here. So we've got we have discovered that kind of just makes it feel a little bit softer than just saying the API delivered. So you're kind of like almost blaming the API on that, but it's like we've actually figured this out. We've learned that this is a thing. Uh, it's not returning data in the way that we had planned for rather than it's not returning data um, and it's not showing on the forms. So you're kind of you're softening it by um, talking about how you're related to it and not all customer data instead of saying no customer data. You're not saying anything different. You're saying exactly the same thing, but the way that you've softened that data, uh, sorry, the way that you've softened that language just feels different. So we are going to need additional sprints instead of saying we need additional sprints. Also one to two sprints. Now I know this is controversial, <clears throat> um, but I like to give ranges. Um, so in this instance, maybe you think it's about one and a half, but you're not sure. Um, but also maybe you're giving them a little bit of um, expectation management on the fact that it might be a little bit longer. So you want to give them a range. Although bear in mind that you do need to understand how your stakeholder takes data because some stakeholders will read that and go, OK, it's one sprint. It's going to be one sprint. So we also have the opportunity. So it's like, OK, you've got a positive thing. You've got an action that you can do rather than we can because that can statement is quite pointy and direct. We could also explore other MVP options instead of descoping, the worst thing you could ever really say. Even though that's probably what you're going to be doing, you're going to go and descope a bunch of stuff. Um, but exploring other MVP options just sounds like a much more positive scenario. I believe the decision rather than saying the decision is with you. Please let me know if it's correct. Don't forget to add in a please or a thank you. Ideally, we would rather than we will. Like again, it's just like you're saying the same thing, but it's less pointy. Um, and let me know if this will be possible rather than let me know. Like again, it's just it's extra words and sometimes it might feel a little bit fluffy. But when you use modal verbs, passive voice, choice of words, rephrasing and minimizers, you can change the way that the statement sounds. OK, now on the flip side, let's look at some areas where this could be softened a little bit more. So where the API is being delivered by the vendor, like you're pointing fingers at this point. Um, there may be a scenario where you need to point fingers. I mean, you need to like explain the facts, um, but you might not need to say that. It might be pretty obvious that the API was delivered by a specific vendor. And maybe you do need to have a conversation about some point about what that relationship's looking like. But just be aware that when you use that active voice, what the reaction to that might be. Without degrading the experience. OK, that actually sounds quite bad. Um, degrading, like that's a negative word. Um, so you could change, change it to something like without changing our planned customer experience. Like, yes, you're saying exactly the same thing, but you're saying it in a much um, less negative way. I will need you to communicate this. This is written by someone who reads a dictionary for fun. Um, I believe the decision of whether to do the rework and get agreement of nude go live date is with you as with identifying alternative, et cetera. Like, there's just a lot of words. You could say, um, I think the next steps are with you. Can you just let me know if that's right? You can just make that a little bit more colloquial, a little bit more casual. Um, and if you let me know if you want to proceed like again 
why have I read too many dictionaries? But you could just change that to say, if you want to go ahead, again, just make that language a little bit more casual. Okay, so I've done a bunch of talking. We're going to get back to the PayPal framework. So I would love for you to try and think about this on a project that you have right now. You don't have to post this in the chat, don't worry. Um, but just, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes, maybe three minutes, to try and use this to, you know, write down or just think about um, a problem that you've got right now on a project or maybe in your personal life if you want to figure out how to solve a problem with your partner. Um, but how could you use both um, the uh, modal verbs, passive voice, choice of words, rephrasing and minimizers in conjunction with problem, impact, plan, owner and when? So how can you use PayPal and soft language together to think about a project problem? I'm going to shut up for a couple of minutes and I'll let you just have a think. How are you going? How are you going with uh, trying that on a project problem? Amazing, nice one, Jeff. That's not a bad idea. Go back and have a look at previous steering committee reports, you know, like emails where you've sent it to a client and you've had to say something bad and you've had to write it. Like, how could you have used this framework to maybe make that a little bit um, of an easier message to receive? Yes, I would also like PayPal to be done to me because then I'll have all the facts and I will know what happens next. So what I want to say is that figuring out what you need to say and how you want to say it, it is an art form <clears throat> and it takes a lot of practice and it's not easy and that's okay because like I said, we are built on human connection, but we're not really taught a lot of the stuff. This is all about sensing and responding and hopefully not getting bitten by a dog or having a crying stakeholder baby, but it takes practice. Um, but I do promise you that the more you get comfortable with this, the easier 
uh, it will get, the, sorry, the more you practice, the more comfortable you get with this. So in summary, I really want to remind, want you to remind yourself of the motivations of a negative reaction to news. So like when you say something to someone and they react, you don't need to take it personally. And again, I know that it's very, very easy to say and hard to do, um, but there are, you just got to remind yourself that there are reasons why people react to things in a, in, in a particular way. They may actually just be hungry. I know I do that. I get really hangry. Um, also, beware of your fear cycle. So if, you're, if you've had a bad reaction to something and you're going into that fear cycle, it's going to really impact your ability to communicate effectively with stakeholders. So hopefully if you have like a, you know, I call it my spidey sense, where something happens, I just get like a weird pang. I can't really articulate what it is, probably because I'm autistic and I don't really know what my feelings are. Um, but if you get like a weird feeling when something happens, um, acknowledge it and try and think, is this my fear cycle talking? Am I holding off on having this communication because I'm scared of what the reaction is going to be? You want to build your personal relationship with your stakeholders. It is super important. I mean, you kind of want to build your personal relationship with everybody that you have to communicate with um, because it just makes it easier when you are trying to deliver bad news or kind of just even have any sort of brainstorm or conversation. It's just so much easier when you understand that person. You want to understand their communication style, their preferences. So you can go to, um, you can use Crystal Nose, which I saw that someone posted in the chat before. You also probably want to tell them you're going to be a little bit no bullshit with them. You might even want to tell them that my job as project manager is to be the news reporter and report the facts. You want to try and soften your language. It really does help, I can assure you, it, but it takes work. So that email previously that you would have just busted out really, really quickly, go back and reread it and just double check that you have softened the language and you're not going, you know, you're not, you're using the right modal verbs, you're not using active voice, your choice of words is right. You're rephrasing and you're using minimizers where it makes sense. And you're using PayPal. So you can, you know, write this on a post-it note, put it on your monitor, just remind yourself in your day to day, you know, if you're preparing for a steering committee where you're gonna have to present, you can write out the things you're going to say. You can practice it. Um, and you can just remind yourself when you're writing your emails, Slack messages, your status reports, whatever it is in your communications. Just try and think about how you could apply PayPal. And that's that. Thank you. Brilliant presentation and um, a very useful model. Uh, so thank you very much, Annie. Questions for any now. I'm just going to scroll up in the chat. <laughs> yes, so, you were. <laughs> so one of the things, Annie, is there are at least three people who love to read dictionaries for fun. Oh, I'm so glad. I feel like I'm in the <laughs> place. You know those? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a total weirdo, but that's okay. Now I just go down like um, TikTok, YouTube holes, Instagram holes, Wikipedia holes, whatever the documentary topic is that I'm going to go on <laughs> Netflix. I'm glad to hear that other people read dictionaries. Good. The P power. Oh, Brian, thank you. I appreciate that. I did see a question. Uh, okay, a lot depends on the culture of an organization. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and I think this is where, like, you know, I've experienced <clears throat> not just in my own kind of career, um, having to, you know, work at companies where there's not really a culture of feedback and transparency, um, but also as a, I suppose, a consultant going into clients' organizations and realizing they have a lot of politics. Um, this kind of feedback culture is really, really hard to build. Um, which I think probably is why we're not very good at communicating because <laughs> I think everyone's scared of it. Everyone's got politics. Um, but I think, you know, it, even in Radical Candor, um, the book that I mentioned before by Kim Scott, she talks about how you, sh um, if you're going to start doing Radical Candor with one of your staff members, that you should tell them that you're going to be doing it um, because it kind of sets that expectation that, you know, you're all only ever going to do it for the right reasons, which, you know, for the Radical Candor perspective is that you're only going to do it because you want to help that person 
in this perspective, it's because you only you, your your whole point is trying to make that project go better and give a, you know arm that stakeholder with the facts. But yeah, no, I acknowledge that it, there are some company cultures where it may be a bit uncomfortable. Yeah. Yes, Dave. Back to the early point about understanding communication styles. The language chosen chosen should align with who is receiving it. I agree. Um, I feel like there's probably something that's a little bit of a meeting in the middle there um, because, and this is probably me just speaking really personally, like it's really, really hard for me to adjust my communications as an autistic person um, to neurotypical um, communication styles. Like I can try really, really hard, but I might fuck it up. Um, but yes, no, I agree with that. And if you stop sharing, then we can see everyone on the screen and I'll stop playing around with the gallery. Done. Stop sharing. OK, that's good. So uh, there was a question. So Michelle, do you want to ask your question or do you want me to read it out? Or, uh, oh, I can ask it if I can do so without getting uh, flamed from random attendees. Um, so the some of the writing tips are kind of opposite to what you often hear. Like if you're writing things, you get told, don't use the passive voice, don't add these little modifiers, don't do this, don't do that. And my question was, mm. when you do put them in, have you ever had kind of a pushback from somebody going, ah, this is, you're using weasel words, just tell me how it is, rant, rant, rant. And I guess that kind of plays back into, you need to know who yeah. like the person is and what the communication styles are and all that kind of stuff. But I just wondered if you'd ever had you know, I can see like the good things from doing that, but I wonder if you've ever had some sort of experience where you were like, ooh, righto, let me go back. <laughs> yeah. Um, so interestingly, the only time I've ever been told that um, was by an, uh, a senior manager, one of my senior managers, who pointed out that I was using words like I believe and I think. This was, this was a man who was telling me this. Um, and as a woman, when, uh, the woman, the woman disclaimers. Yeah, when you're a woman, if you use, if you offer like um, an opinion rather than a fact, often that is taken as not. No one's going to have to listen to that because it's not real. It's just an opinion. Um, and so I went through a process of trying to take that out. And what I did notice is that in some aspects it works and I think it makes sense again it kind of depends on who you're talking to mm. like if you're something I experience very regularly if you're the only woman in a room full of 10 other men <laughs> you're probably not going to be like well I think this and I kind of also think it, it depends on how you say it like if you say well I think so mm. or say I think that this is going to be a thing like if you make your voice go down that becomes a statement, even though you've used those kind of softening words. Yeah, so, cool. I don't know. I guess this is something that I've thought about for a while. I mean, again, being autistic, no, I haven't had a lot of people saying my, my language is too soft. <laughs> I wonder if there's anyone else that has. Thank you. Like we have a question here. Um, what's the question? So Stefan is saying, thanks for this, Annie. Super useful. Any tips on how to listen for clues to change your communication style for a particular stakeholder? Hmm, good question. Wow, that is a really big question. Um, OK. I'm going to have to think about this one for a little bit longer, but off the top of my head, the sorts of things that I notice, because again, this even happened to me today, is um, I think this is probably because I'm so paranoid about saying the wrong thing, um, is that I will watch everyone's face in a meeting. And if I say something, I'll just kind of glance around the room and just see if I can see any little like micro expressions on people's face. Like, has someone furrowed their brow? Have they pursed their lips? Have they like crossed their arms after I said it? Like all of those things are, um, you know, pretty obvious um, ways to sh just to demonstrate that they don't like what you've said. Um, and so I would just like kind of look out for those micro expressions. 
there is a really awesome uh, um, study by a guy who I can't remember who talked about microexpressions, but I'm sure if you Google microexpression study, there is a whole kind of like photo collage of what all those microexpressions look like. And so if you know what those are, you can start to identify them in people. Yes, when they lean back like this and then they like furrow their brow and purse their lips. I mean, that's the worst, to be honest. You probably fucked up on that point. Don't do what you said. Don't, don't, don't do that again. <laughs> the types of questions they ask. I mean, I think in terms of the types of questions that people might ask is they might, if you think back to those, um, those five things, which I'm going to try and remember because they're not in front of me, but modal verbs, um, active voice, um, you know, the opposite of minimizers, like all of those sorts of things. If they're using them back to you, it's probably a sign that they might not be happy. And again, this is all like getting out the, you know, the magnifying glass, like detective work. Like this is not, it's not easy You're trying to understand what are the things that people are thinking that they're not actually saying. Good point, yeah. But Kashif has raised a very good point here as well about uh, language softening, which is if someone's first language is not English, then the, the whole equation changes. Mm -hmm. Totally. I love French people. They're so direct. Um, and if you work with Israeli customers, that will be, you know, it'll, so, be, it'll be wonderful. If you work with Israeli customers, someone from Israel, um, the generally, the general usage of language is so aggressive and so direct. It's probably based on the culture, but you feel like they're hitting, hitting at you all the time. Correct. Yeah, I worked with Israeli teams, so I know they're very, very <laughs> Israelis and Russian teams. Yeah. Yeah. Germans, the Nordics, the French—they're all very direct. My peoples—they probably wouldn't even know if I was, I was autistic if I went there. Um, someone has their hand up. Abhijit. Hi, Ami. Thank you. Look, this this has really been a um, very insightful um, session for me. Um, uh, a question I have is um, the recent, you know, remote working culture, disconnectedness, etc. Have you had to double down on being vigilant about um, you know, this whole people model that you've talked about. Have you had to double down? Have you have you noticed that there's been uh, any any change in styles that you had to adopt um, versus a in person in a conference room sort of a, a briefing to stakeholders versus? Well, as an example, I'm leaning back on my chair in my lounge room and um, how it's does that play nice. into all your micro expression um, theory too? Yeah, that's such a good question. It, it, it does make it really hard. But you know, one thing I've noticed is really interesting with like this whole kind of team situation. Like even though you can see someone's pixels on your screen, like it's it looks like them, but it's not really a representation of them. And yes, you can sort of see their face, but you can't really see everything um, that's going on. One thing I've noticed is that sometimes just picking up the phone and having like a normal phone conversation can feel a lot more human and connected than having a Teams call. And I don't know what that is. I don't know why, but that feels like something. So um, I try to, if I like, if I have to deliver bad news, I mean, first of all, like again, you kind of need to assess the situation, but I will choose my medium according to that person. And then I will, you know, I would do this anyway, pre kind of the world being strange like it is today. But you know, you kind of have to give the message in, in various ways. So whatever you think you've communicated, you can assume that it hasn't been heard and you need to communi communicate it again. So if you've got like bad news, you don't want to be delivering that for the first time in a status report or in a steering committee. You want to call them up first, have a conversation. You want to have a Teams meeting, um, try and kind of assess what's going on. And then like, you kind of want to communicate it in mul multiple different ways. So I don't think necessarily that that has changed, but I think maybe that the power of just a phone call is more than it used to be. I don't know if anyone else feels that way. Is 
say a few notes. Uh, either no one feels that way or um, no one is saying it. But I think, uh, look, it's more about um, if you're just talking to someone on phone, then um, um, your voice is basically they are listening to your voice and maybe the intonation in the voice is playing an important role there. I don't know. It could be um, facing someone on a screen and when I look at the screen, I'm actually not looking at you. I'm looking at the camera, so that makes the difference there as well. So maybe you're actually not looking at them and you're looking at their picture and picture isn't really saying something. When you look someone in the eyes, things are different. You know what? I think I've just articulated just another autistic trait because I don't like looking people in the eyes anyway. Um, but also, uh, I think maybe the difference is that when you're talking to someone on Teams, there's always a lag and it always just feels just like the slightest bit unnatural. And when you talk to someone on the phone, it's kind of instant. And so even though you can't see that person's face, it feels a little bit more connected. I guess it depends. <laughs> Dan says, if, someone's, if someone calls me on the phone, I know it's serious. Yeah, that's weird. What is that about? Old school. You, you you just reminded me to break an unconscious bias. I personally have any is uh, if if I don't see the person that I'm talking to, if I don't see them seeing me in the eye, I find that a I'm 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 not connecting, and then I find something's off. So thank you for calling that out as um, something that is a, a prejudiced, unconscious bias. Thank you. Yeah, it's funny, eh? <laughs> some people prefer it, some people don't. Some people literally can't do it. For me, it feels like lasers. Um, Rob, you have your hand up. Yeah, hi, Annie. Um, yeah, I don't know, you, you may, may or may not remember me. I worked with you when I was at Ice Bar in Perth, awesome. but um, <laughs> um, I met you once and yeah, it was a great experience. But um, look, I just want to, I want to go right back to the start of your talk. And it was a great talk, by the way. Um, the, you, you talked about, um, you know, knowing the person you're engaging with and, and giving them a, I guess, a, um, you know, a, a questionnaire to fill out to find out who they are and, and you know, what, how they how they work. And if they, if, it, if they're too busy to do that, then then sure, um, hey, I've got this extension that's going to scan your emails and and, <laughs> and and tell me who you are. I, I look, I that's that's the only bit that really didn't resonate with me. I I just don't see any of my clients agreeing to do that. And mm -hmm. I just wondered if you had any thoughts around, you know, how how do we get to know our stakeholders um, in a way that's you know, I can buy them a beer, I can talk to them, that's all good. But, you know, I, I, I doubt many of my my clients are going to agree to let me install an extension on their, you know, that's going to scan their emails. But um, oh, what, what are your thought? What are your thoughts around that? Just just to, you know, can you expand on that just a little bit more around, you know, maybe ultimate strategies around um, getting to know our, our, our people and, and how we talk to them? Totally. Firstly, you don't install it on their computer. <laughs> It just looks like in, in your inbox or you can just like it'll look at their LinkedIn. Like it's not, it, I mean, it's a little bit creepy. It's not that creepy. Um, I mean, I think you can, if you understand what a tool like Crystal Knows is doing, you can just look at the way that they write and the way that they talk and kind of get the information yourself. Um, so, I mean, basically, I mean, it's kind of like love languages. I don't know if you know anything about the five love, love languages. But the way that somebody shows love is actually the way they want to receive love. And it's the same with communication styles. The same, the way that someone communicates is the way they want to be communicated with. Um, so I think you can like look at their, you know, you can listen to the way they speak. Um, you can listen to the types of words that they say and kind of just like, you know, do they use a lot of words? Do they use some words? And you can look at their emails. Do they use bullet points? Are they quite lengthy? If if they're using a lot of words in their emails to you, I can guarantee they probably want you to use more words with them. Um, so that's probably the first one. I think in terms of like, how do you get to know people? I fucking hate schmoozing. <laughs> hate it. Hate it with a passion. Um, but, and this is probably from, you know, again, a neurodivergent perspective. <clears throat> when it comes to like talking about small talk or like hobbies, 
work, marriage, weather, all that sort of stuff. Like I just, I don't see that very, very important. Um, but if you can find a way to connect with someone on what their passion is, like I know that's maybe a weird thing to like ask someone directly what their passion is, but maybe you can figure out a, a softer way of asking that. Um, but if you can start to get someone to talk about something that they're excited about, that conversation is just going to flow. Um, again, for me, as an autistic person, it's kind of the only thing that I can talk about is something that I'm passionate about that I want to talk about. Um, but I guarantee that there are a lot more people out there that you don't know are neurodivergent and probably who also don't know that they are neurodivergent. But the one thing that everybody likes to talk about is either themselves or something that they really care about. So if you can kind of figure out those things, and then you can connect over that and find, you know, where do your Venn diagrams overlap, then you'll be able to build that personal connection with them. I hope that answers your question. It's a really big question. These are big questions. Thanks, Annie. Yeah, it, it was a big question and, yeah. and um, I didn't expect like a perfect response, but um, <laughs> you've given me some insight um, and, and, and today has been really good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Annie, I'm trying to put links in the chat for you. The first one that occurred to me was Management 3.0's Personal Maps tool, yeah. which is like a great way to do this in Teams. And then the other one, um, sorry, Teams just kills my computer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Rajesh, help us out here, okay? Um, sure. Uh, <laughs> um, the other one I'm thinking of is Job or Joy. So Job or Joy is like a fun kind of, some of you may have even done it in retros or team formation or something, but it's like it involves post-its. It's You can do it pretty quick and it's a great way to find out what do you love and hate at work and home. So I'm going to share a link for that in a sec as well. Yeah, and I think kind of going back to what you said before, Rob, uh, like I know this sort of stuff is kind of like a lot of senior stakeholders feel like this fluffy stuff is all a little bit naff. Um, but if you look at the stuff that's in personal maps, which I'm really going to try and press the my memory here, it's like education, work, family, friends, hobbies, values, two other things <laughs> but if you can like start a topic about those sorts of things these are sort of things that people really care about um you can do it in a in a group setting to kind of like um do a little bit of team building some people like that some people don't um or you can just kind of like ask the questions and just pepper them in, in through your conversations with them don't know if there are any other questions I have one, Annie. Go for Har it. Harshita, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very insightful. Sometimes I get really conscious, especially in regards to the body language. Sometimes when I'm thinking or if it is cold or something in the meetings, I have like 21 agencies that I work with, or, uh, the government agencies, and we are like the central agency. And I start thinking sometimes like because I'm connecting many thoughts kind of thing. And I'm someone who is like, and do like this and those kind of things and thinking as well. And how much of these body language that people take seriously out of it? Sometimes I'm like, nowadays I'm like, oh, I should not do that. I should not do that because people are going to perceive me in a different way kind of thing. But I do those things just for my own understanding. I'm connecting different things. But I don't know, I'm a little bit scared at how I'm coming across in front of people yeah. as well. I uh, share your pain there. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, totally a thing. Um, I don't know what the answer to that is, especially once we go back into the office and then everyone re remembers that office temperatures are two to five degrees colder because they're set for men, men's body heat um, rather than women, and we're always just freezing in meeting rooms. Um, so that makes things tough. Um, but I, I know it's really hard. Like, I think if you don't have that personal connection with people to be able to just say, hey, I'm really cold, or hey, um, when I'm thinking, I'm going to do this. And that doesn't mean that I'm, uh, you know, I'm not like ignoring you or just like, oh, I was just thinking about that thought. Like you can kind of relate the kind of the thing that you're trying to say to the action that you're doing. So that kind of makes it a little bit difficult. I mean, I know what I do. Well, I know what I used to do. I used to sit on my hands and I used to just think about it the whole time and it sucked. Um, and I can see that Tash has said, be yourself. Yeah, totally. I mean, oh, the shit's hard. Like, I don't really know how to answer that because there isn't really a good answer. Like, I think 
be aware of your body language and be aware of how people might perceive it, but try not to change your body language in a way that makes you not be able to focus. Cool. Yeah, thank you. At least I get to know that someone else also feels the same. So that is a much better feeling. Thank totally. you so much. Um, I actually did a body language course um, years and years and years ago, which was super, super helpful. I have no doubt there'll be something amazing on like LinkedIn about body language, but definitely recommend looking into it. And then you just can, can just be a little bit more aware. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I'm a bit scared. The more I read about it, the more conscious I've become. And I'm right. losing out my natural So I don't know how to strike that balance. Oh, well, that's fine. I'll find that balance somehow might be down the line. Thanks. Yeah, it's a hard one. Any other final questions? We're already 18 minutes over, my bad. Yeah, it's an interesting conversation, so yeah, good. Any other questions, observations, suggestions, ideas? I just wanted to add something about the um, the, the reference came to five love languages earlier. In fact, um, people have um, different preferences to sensory interaction with information and other people around them. They have the preferred input formats, that is the VACOG model that uh, divides everything into visual, auditory, um, gestatory, olfactory, and kinesthetic. Um, and so people have a favorite input one, but also a favorite processing one. Um, we used to think that most people prefer the visual um, the visual processing of information. In fact, it's quite inaccurate. It was just in a <laughs> couple, as usual, in a couple of given studies, in a very given context in universities, people preferred uh, visual input, but it didn't mean that they preferred to process it that way. That means the way they interact with the information you give and how they answer questions and how they explain, how they think, depends on their preferences. These ones are quite hard to determine how they emerge because it depends on the upbringing, the context, the formation of their beliefs, their experiences, so you see how complicated it gets. My point here is to the five low languages point is people tend to explain um, or expect to be given information in the format that they prefer. Um, mm -hmm. What I mean by tend to is it's very unconscious and they can even get angry or irritated if you don't do it in that format. So a very useful mm -hmm. thing to do is see how they're doing things and then as much as you're elastic enough to do that, try to play it back in that same format. Some people are very mature in that regard. They're very well trained. They practice it a lot, especially coaches, for example, and they're able to have a very wide range of, let's say, uh, sensory elasticity and that's really something you can practice um, neurologically speaking um that's i'm gonna stop here otherwise go, go on tangent um, no i think that's awesome i i reckon that you should do the next meetup and talk about that because that is such an awesome topic um i have actually been having this conversation with my manager my my ceo um, where he is a verbal communicator and I'm a written communicator, I'm written and um, kinetic, so I need to, I learn by like doing or writing. Um, and God, it is a clash of communication styles. But the first thing is like talking about it and understanding it and acknowledging it. And like I said, you know, earlier um, in the talk, so many companies are not investing in this. And maybe if you're lucky, if you did like, you know, Psych 101 or you learned something in school, you might know about this, but a lot of people don't know these things. So um, I look forward to your meetup. I can't wait for it, actually. Do we possibly have an um, idea for our next meetup then? And but talking talking about the point that you just raised, that a lot of big companies do not uh, invest in this kind of things is possibly because companies, the, the driver for majority of the companies is revenue. Shareholders, not stakeholders and stakeholders by stakeholders i mean people either employees or the um, the customers did you look at jeff bezos um, clip yesterday when he said in gist um, after coming back from from the space and he said um, thank you for paying for my visit or something like that and he was saying to all my um, employees and customers now his focus and uh, similarly for uh, many other companies the focus is not the employees or the customers. Focus is making money, increasing the revenue, right? And of course, if it is about increasing the revenue, the, the last thing that you do is uh, invest in your own people. 
So here you go. And I see I see the difference since I joined Microsoft in the last nearly eight months. I see the difference how the focus is completely on diversity, inclusion, and those those so DNI is one of the core priorities of Microsoft. And I was surprised to see that in the strategy document that we need to do that. So we can see the difference. Well, Jeff Bezos, who says, thanks for paying for this. And we know that um, Amazon warehouses, people don't get uh, bathroom rights. So that's the difference. <sighs> Eat the rich is all I can say. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Thank you all uh, for joining and obviously sticking around for 25 minutes extra to just chat about random stuff. Um, yeah, and Mark, I'm really glad that you're probably going to have a little bit more empathy for why your wife is cold and why you are not. <laughs> Be nice to her. <laughs> I, I oh, promise I was not aware today of this research, so I, I'm really I just I'm sending her the links and I'm about to say sorry tonight. Uh, so thanks right. for sharing this information. That makes me, that makes my heart swell with joy. Um, there is a book that I can recommend to, it's called Invisible Woman. Um, give that one a whirl. Cool. Thank you all. Right, thank you so much, Annie. And um, thank you. Thanks a lot, Annie. Really this. Yeah. Thank you. It's a very engaging, very engaging talk. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And if anyone wants to, participate, contribute, or speak at the next meetup, let me know. Mario, I will connect with you. And Julia, yourself as well. And of course, let me, <laughs> let me drop my LinkedIn. Connect with me and yeah, yeah, sure, right, thank you. Yeah. All right, okay. And then if you can send a video uh, recording, then uh, we will share with others, yeah? Yeah, no worries. Thank you, have a fantastic evening. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Bye. Right. Thanks, Annie, and thanks for Josh for organising. Cheers, man. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for joining.